Good afternoon, welcome along to Racing TV for the final episode of The Racing Years. We look back at the year 2019. Hope everyone is well at what is a very testing time. As ever, get in touch using studio at racingtv.com, uh, studio at racingtv.com for the email address or at Racing TV on Twitter to get your thoughts, your favorite races or your memories from the year that was 2019. But to begin with, we'll take a look back at some of the highlights from last year. Here's the final fence in a champion chase, and it was so royal who jumped the lead. Alfior is digging, Politologi's coming on the outside. They've got a half hour long to go. Alfior just doesn't want to let his championship go, and he's galvanised by De Moinville, and Alfior is going to win another champion chase. Aidan Coleman produces Paisley Park to lead at the final flight of hurdles to Sam Spinner, Paisley Park. That wasn't clever, he only landed by a neck. He's given Sam Spinner another chance. Bob Pope is running on. There again he gets going. Paisley Park has moved on by two lengths with Aidan Coleman. He's won all his races this season. Now he's won the Sun Racing Stay at Hurdle. Paul Townend on album photo and he's safely over and drawing away four or five lengths to Bristol to May then Annabelle Fly, Native River and Clanders Opo and stretching out up the hill it's album photo, Annabelle Fly is staying on well but no photo required album photo wins the Magnus Cheltenham Gold Cup it's been 45 years and now Davy Russell shakes up Tiger Roll. Magic of Light in second, Rap Vinden in third, Walk in the Mill is back in fourth. Tiger Roll is remarkable. He comes up towards the winning line under Davy Russell to win his second round of Health Grand National. Inside the final 200 yards, Kem Boy from Album Photo, who's giving it everything, but Kem Boy will win it. Three gold cups in three months. For the champion trainer, Willie Mullins. It's Enable with the advantage. Magical is trying hard behind. Regal Reality staying on, but it's Enable under Frankie Dettori to win the current eclipse. Magical tried her heart out but couldn't get to Enable. But brilliant there, she's done it. Too darn hot, Frankie has led at the furlong pole. Going on to Circus Maximus in second place. I can fly behind those in third place. They race towards the line. Again, Frankie Dettori and John Goldstone. Too darn hot. Magic Hill has gone for home with the quick for Irish champion. Chased by Magic One, Deadly Van Dyke. Headman next with Mad Moon. But it's Magic Hill in front as they run to the finish. It's her stage, the Quip for Irish champion stage. Into the closing stages, the dark blue Arizona, the royal blue Pina Tubo, who's in front of him now. Six from six, Pina Tubo wins by a couple. Stradivere is taking on Q Gardens. They race as one now, inside the final furlong. Stradivere is just with the edge. Q Gardens will not lie down without a battle. Stradivere is in Q Gardens. Q Gardens fights back and may have won. Yeah, some super memories from 2019. We'll be reflecting on plenty of them over the next hour and a half or so. Star-studded guests coming your way on the line from both the world of the flat and indeed the jumps, those that lit up the year 2019. Two uh, contributors as well uh, will join us throughout the show. And indeed, I can introduce the first of them now. And it's fair to say, uh, Ruby Walsh, very good afternoon to you, that um, 2019 in, in so many ways, but... For May the 1st, I suppose, that, that pinpoint date, a very, very significant date and a very significant year for you. It sure was, Nick, and I'm glad that I made the decision to retire in 2019. I wasn't waiting for 2020, <laughs> but um, it was. It was a great day. I was lucky the way it went, and um, Ken Boy gave me the ending I was looking for to my career as a jockey. Well, oh, Nick, what, sort of mid, late April now? We, we're actually only a couple of weeks away from the one-year anniversary of that. Has, has it flown this year since then, the, the, the calendar year since? I think it has, but um, I'm 40 now as well, Nick, and as people say, the older you get, the quicker the years go, so <laughs> they do seem to be flying along. But, uh, yeah, it has been a quick year. It's been a great year, obviously, without the coronavirus. That's been very sad and disappointing for everybody, but... 
Um, personally, on a whole, it was a great year. You did ride again later in the year in September. We'll come to that. But just as a whole, in the racing landscape, we saw the clip there of Tiger Roll uh, becoming the first horse since Red Rum in 1974 to win back-to-back -back Grand Nationals. Pinatubo, the emergence of that superstar two-year-old. Asheen Murphy, his first championship. Willie Mullins, a first gold cup after, I think, six silver medals. Um, quite an interesting year to look back on. Yeah, there's loads to look back on, as you, you touched on them all there, Nick. I mean, Al Boone Photo for William Paul Town and Tiger Roll. Obviously, Frankie Dettori and John Gosling, the year they had mm. Pinatubo. Can't believe I half questioned his ability when he saw him win the Nepsum at the Derby meeting, but he, like, his performance in the Curra and the Champion Stakes was incredible to watch. So, yeah, lots to look back on, and there were some outstanding performances in there. And it went all the way to the end, even with Kew Gardens and Stradivarius in the the stairs race on Champions Day. That was a brilliant race to watch. And, of course, it all wound up in the King George. What a great race that was, too. Yeah, loads to look back on. Ruby will be uh, with us throughout, looking back at the year 2019. Time to introduce uh, my second guest, and that is Kevin O'Ryan. Your first appearance on uh, the racing years. How are you, Kevin? Uh, what is testing times, of course, for everyone, not just in racing, uh, but globally? Yes, yeah, very good afternoon, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Unfortunately, Ruby's better... Uh, 5G covers than I have. I only live a mile down the road from, so that's why uh, my internet isn't as good as his internet. So uh, that's why I'm over the phone. But look, keep him busy, uh, painting the place, and cre sorting railings, and loads keep me occupied. But it's in testing times. We will get through it. We're all working together. And uh, please, God, we'll come back to some sort of normality in the not too distant future. Now, it'd be remiss, we've introduced Ruby, you've introduced yourself. We'll come to it a bit later, but very quickly, just on that day, the 1st of May last year, the, the, the Gold Cup at Punchestown, won by Ken Boy. I think you were on hand for Racing TV after to, to interview Ruby when we had the news that that was it. He was, he was retiring and it came as a huge shock, didn't it? Yes, it did. But obviously, as Ruby said, he's 40 years of age now. It was the inevitable is going to come eventually. And one thing Ruby did, which is fantastic, like A.P. Mackay, he went out in the top. And any top sports person of their era in any form of sport should go out in the top. And Ruby was able to go out in his own terms after a wonderful career, one of the greatest jockeys you've ever seen. And for him to go out as uh, Punchestown as well. He's been going there since he's a kid. He's been brought up right alongside it. Punchestown is very close to his heart. To have all his family there that day, it, you couldn't have wrote the script. What else stood out for you, Kevin, in 2019 when you, were, when you were having a look back at the year that was? Yeah, so many different things, Nick. Uh, one of my personal highlights was later on in the season, uh, for obvious reasons, it was a Pat Mullen day at the Curra. Ruby obviously came back with AP and all the other lads who rode, <coughs> uh, excuse me, that day. And uh, it was today, it was that day that uh, it just showed what a racing community it is when somebody's in need, they all rally around together. The Curra for me was officially opened that day. And uh, people who, are, who would never go to the Curra, they came from all over to support Pat Smullen, to support his charity. The money they raised and are continuing to raise is overwhelming. It was an unbelievable atmosphere. You had people who were rip-roaring National Hunt people from Cork and all over the different parts of the country. They wouldn't even watch flat racing. They decided to go to the Curra that day. It was testament to Pat and all the guys who rode in the race. And also on that day, my second highlight would be Search for a Song winning the Irish St. Ledger. The reason being for Dermot Weldon, for Chris Hayes, but the reason being for My Glare Stud. It was very apt that Ava Hafner, who owns My Glare Stud, who is, uh, had a personally um, working relationship, a uh, very, very professional and long-standing relationship with Pat for many, many years. Mm. and. Uh, Mr. Hafner, the late Walter Hafner. And it was just fitting that Ava Hafner had a winner of a classic on the day that Pat Smullen had his charity race. And for me, they were the both highlights. Both of them were intertwined. There's a lot of history between both parties. And for me, that was the highlight. Those two were the highlights of the year. Well, nice words, Kevin. We will come to that a little bit later on. We'll be hearing from one of the, the riding stars of the National Hunt world in a few moments' time. But before that, we'll take a look back at the Cheltenham Festival of 2019. And the first race we'll look back at uh, is the highlight on day one, and that was, of course, the champion hurdle. It was won by the five-year-old Espoir Dallaire. Now, Ruby, I've got to get your thoughts on this. We can see you uh, third from the left there, or on the left, on, on Lorena. Um, this was billed as the big clash. Bouvedere was looking for the three-timer. He come down by this point. Apple's Jade, you can see she, she wasn't up to her best. What was your take on it from Lorena this day, Ruby? 
I think it was a race that changed very early, Nick. Obviously, Apples J jumped very right at the second hurdle, and her goose looked cooked very early. Then, as you say, Bouvard there fell at the first down the back, and to be honest, right in the arena, I never thought I was going to beat Mellon um, at any stage, so and that's the way it transpired. She only finished fourth, but the winner was brilliant on the day, Espard Allen, obviously for Gavin Conwell and Mark Walsh and JP McManus. It was... Um, was a great performance obviously what happened to him in the autumn was very very sad for them he yeah. was lost in an accident at home and look the world looked his his future here in the hurdle in front I and mean, he's absolutely routed the opposition in a champion hurdle but the future just didn't didn't have it for him now, is it was it just you, you mentioned obviously Mark Walsh in the saddle he had a good festival I think he had seven grade ones in 2019 but for for Gavin Cromwell obviously so cruelly taken away the horse but what an advocate what well just a, a brilliant way to advocate how good a trainer he is well definitely and I think Gavin's rise to the training ranks from that well up until then and it still continued I mean his strike rate this season in Ireland was 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 amazing and it was very interesting when when the Cromwell team back won invariably collects Nick absolutely I just want to get your thoughts on that because obviously Kevin when we were, were building up the champion hurdle it was seemingly the three way clash and then sometimes when things get built up you can have clashes between one or two or three of them of course and it doesn't always go to script but I suppose it does leave us searching for what we might have had with Espar Dallin long term yes definitely and go back to your point building up a, a race with two or three look at this year's uh, champion chase uh, that fell apart, obviously, right up until the last uh, minute of the day, uh, that morning when Willie's horses were withdrawn. But uh, obviously, as Ruby said, the complexion of the race has totally changed to third when, uh, obviously, Bouvedere has come down. He's brought down Sharjah, who was a big player as well in the race under Patrick Mullins. But uh, it's just a shame, as Ruby said, that we didn't really get to see Espor Dalan uh, going on. He was only a five-year-old and he won that race. He improved mm. no end. He was a big prize going into it. But there was no fluke about it. He's travelled well, he's jumped well, he travelled like a winner a long way. Watching just there now again, like Ruby seemed to be holding on to nothing from around three out. Mellon was starting to run an empty as well. Mark Walsh had loads of harsh underneath him and he quickened well from the back of the last. He was only a five-year-old. He had improved greatly with each run up until the champion hurdle. So you would have been hoping there was going to be a little bit more improvement to come. He would have been a big, big player this year. And it's just a shame for connections that we didn't really get to see him fulfil his potential. Absolutely. Kevin, Ruby, we'll just break off ever so slightly and focusing on the first day of the Cheltenham Festival, time to introduce one of the, uh, the star callers on the day. That is Rachel Blackmore, who's kindly joined us, who had that first festival winner with Aplutard on that very first day. But first up, Rachel, obviously the, the continued downtime. Hopefully you and, you and everyone around are OK at the moment. Yeah, we're all good. Um, it's, uh, it's a strange time for everyone, but uh, yeah, there's no short of work to be done with us. Uh, you did say that too, so we'll keep you keep you only on for a couple of minutes or so. But um, just by yeah. Cheltenham 2019, I think the Irish Championship, you were second to Paul Town and 84 winners, a huge amount by that point anyway. But how did you approach Cheltenham last year? Um, I suppose it was very different for me in that I was heading over there with, with a lot more rides than I'd ever had um, and a lot more lively, lively chances, like plenty of them were going over there. And, uh, you know, very fancied. So it was it was a very much a different challenge for me. But uh, look, it was, it was great that it worked out, and we got two winners out of it. It was a fantastic start to the meeting. Ultimately, on the first day, Aplutard, who turned a competitive handicap traditionally into anything but this was his handicap debut. But. Um, I suppose, given the fact that he'd already beaten Duke de Ginevra, the Arkle winner earlier in the season, and by that point, just a couple of hours before, that horse had won the Arkle, was confidence quite high as a result of that? Yeah, I suppose uh, it added a little bit more pressure um, to the manner in which uh, Duke de Ginevra won the Arkle. But um, look, it was, it was just a, a great relief when he, when he won, and um, yeah, a fantastic memory to have. What's that sensation like? to get that first festival winning because I, th I read a read an article before the 2019 festival that said you'd you had gone to the festival just as a race goer in years gone by to watch it and always want to to be part of it but to do this and to blast home a, a well fancied horse to win a big race at the Cheltenham Festival what is that like? Well I never thought I'd, I'd go up the hill in the in the fashion he did at that speed anyway I, I felt like I landed off the last and he, he got wings so um, oh, it was an unbelievable feeling and you know I was really able to enjoy it I suppose and uh, yeah like it's, it's such a special place and it's um, you know it's where, it's where every jockey wants to be 
and you know then t- to get to ride winners there is just it's just very special. Did it go by in a bit of a blur coming back? Because obviously you, you tasted victory again very quickly afterwards, just a few days later in the Albert Bartlett. But that first winner, were you, were you able to drink it all in on the on the day? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I was. I, I, I remember it and, you know, um, yeah, look, I really enjoyed it. But at the same time, it was the start of, um, you know, it was the start of the two weeks and uh, sorry, two days ahead of me uh, with 24 fancy drive. So it was enjoyable, but we were kind of thinking about the next day as well. And, um, yeah, it's lovely to look back on now. Yeah, that Cheltenham Festival winner to go to well to go alongside all of your other milestones which you're, you're quickly amassing in this career so far which has been an incredible journey but at, obviously at the end of the week a different profile horse in the albert bartlett that was minella indo who goes off a 50 to one shot in the in the three mile novices grade one we see you here and you've picked it up he galloped relentlessly you brought him down to the near side but the 50 to one price tag um did, did you feel that was a reflection of his chance, or was that underestimating him? Obviously, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but going into it, did you feel he had a chance? No, we did. We, we did. Um, you know, I suppose we were hopefully drawing a nice race, and, you know, he was, he was amazing going there. So, you know, it's very hopeful, and Henry always thought a lot of, a lot of him at home, and, uh, yeah, it was, look, it was brilliant for him to, to be able to do it, and, uh, yeah, it was great. Were you happy that you'd all, you, you got to the front when you did? Did you always feel you were covering the others at that point? Because the old rival there, Alaho, who, who'd obviously beaten him at Clonmel the time before, was coming. So too the favourite commander of fleet. But did you always feel in, in what is a proper stamina test that you'd have enough? No, to be honest, I um, jumped in the second last. I was kind of in front when I was thinking. Uh, I rode a horse earlier that day or the day before and, you know, Henry had kind of mentioned to me, you know, hold on a bit longer, uh, was truly on the pretend so he's probably there a bit soon and so that was definitely in the back of my mind so I was kind of thinking, oh God, I hope I hope this horse wins now because I'm, I'm in front sooner than I want to but he was, he, he travels really, really well and he was kind of taking me everywhere um, but yeah, it was, uh, I was just happy that, uh, I was happy that we, we, we uh, stayed with our heads in front. Yeah, it was a super challenge. I just want to keep you a couple of moments longer and talk about Manella Indo again, who went on to Punchestown and, of course, had to confirm the form with Alaho, did it in a different style. Um, were you confident it was always going to be the same result, though? Yeah, I, I couldn't see why not. And, uh, yeah, like, he's, he really um, improved as, as his season goes on. And, um, yeah, like, it was brilliant that he was able to back it up. How good is he? Uh, he is extremely talented, yeah, um, he is, and um, yeah, he, I, I think he's going to he's gonna go all the way to the top. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be hearing a lot more about him next year, um, so yeah, he's really one to look forward to. Yeah, we know what happened, obviously, this year with the, the late surge of champion, the RSA chase, but he's already proven himself a, a quality racehorse as a hurdler and, and as a chaser as well. In terms of what he has best, he, he's obviously got the ability, he's got the stamina, but that toughness and the ability to grind as well, is that everything that sort of ticks boxes in his favour? Yeah, definitely. Um, he stays really well and he jumps. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't enjoy too much watching the, the replay of the RSA this year, but hopefully we can, um, we can change that. Uh, change the results in the festival next year. Absolutely right. I just want to just move on to the end of the year, the 1st of December, and what a significant date. And this was Honeysuckle in the Hatton's Grey. She was unbeaten then. She still is now. And just for the context, I suppose Apple's, um, Honey, Apple's Jade was looking for the four-timer in the Hatton's Grace, but, but your mare, she was so well back. She was so well fancied. And that was such a special performance, wasn't it? It, it really was. Um, Rush, I mean, she's just a pleasure to be involved with. I think every every jockey in their career would love to would love to get their leg over something like her and and be involved with something like her. And um, yeah, it's just it's a privilege to be involved with her. And I think the the job Henry has done with her all the way through it, throughout the season to have her in you know in tip top shape every day she goes racing mm. and like that's a massive credit to him. Well, that's the thing. We're looking at this. This was December, obviously, 2019, and. And come the early start of this year, she'd won the Irish Champion Hurdle in January over the two miles. She's obviously since won the Mayor's Race at the, the Cheltenham Festival with her, Cheltenham Festival as well. I mean, are there still plenty of chapters to be written with her? Are you still learning about her? Yeah, there's plenty more to come, hopefully, but uh, we can't, uh, we can't uh, forget what she's done already. You know, she's already a superstar and uh, 
yeah, as I say, she's just a pleasure to be involved with, and hopefully there's many more good days to come. And is there something about Fairy House? I mean, I could turn to you and say she's unbeaten there, but she's unbeaten everywhere she goes. Is there something about Fairy House that, that particularly suits her? To be honest, I just think um, that the, the plan that Henry had in mind for her and, and the way the races fell is, is more the reason why she ended up back in Fairy House the whole time. Um, so look, she's just extremely versatile, I think, ground, um, you know, trip. You could see all that in Leopardstown. Um, she's very versatile and, mm. uh, yeah, just a, yeah, a pleasure to, to be able to ride. Yeah, some fabulous her. scenes after. I'll ask you about one more horse, if that's OK, and that's, that's Notebook, who we talked about last season, the, de the development, the progression, the improvement from Henry de Bromhead, novice hurdlers, to novice chasers, and he'd be right up there. I think he won four chases last season, two grade ones, Obviously, it's a 2019 program, so we'll just squeeze in the race at Christmas on the 26th of December. But how much talent has this fella got, Rachel? Oh, serious, Amanda. I think um, he's he's an absolute dream to ride. Um, you know, once you can uh, once you can get him down to start in one piece. Uh, but uh, throughout the race, he's absolutely fantastic. He really measures um, his fences, and he just uh, you'd really enjoy riding him as a jockey. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I just think, um, yeah, he's got a whole lot of potential and there's going to be a lot of uh, good days in him in the future. But because he was, but we saw him in February this year, he was quite buzzy on the way down to the start at the Dublin Racing Festival, but he still wins the race anyway. Is that just him? Yeah, it's just him a little bit. Um, I, I probably made the mistake uh, in Leopardstown that day that I went down first. Um, you know, he got a lead down to Cheltenham, but it wasn't a bother. And just lastly with him, the, the Arkle that's just gone at the Cheltenham Festival, I know Henry de Bromhead won the race anyway, we put the kettle on, but what, what was your personal assessment of Notebook that day? Um, I, I just think it's, it's one thing to just draw a line through, and you know, he wasn't really himself, and uh, yeah, he, he's a lot better than that, obviously, but taking nothing away from put the kettle on, she put in an unbelievable performance, and she loves it around Cheltenham, and I don't think it's going to be the last race she wins around there. Absolutely not. Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time out. I'll let you get back to, to what you're getting on with. Um, well done on 2019 and also what's gone on in the early parts of 2020. Keep safe and hopefully we'll see you racing soon. Brilliant. Thanks a million. Uh, Rachel Blackmore there, who reflected on those, uh, to begin with, those two wins at the Cheltenham Festival, at Plutard and Manella Indo. And uh, one hell of a way to showcase the talent that we know she's got, um, Ruby. Oh, without doubt, Nick. I mean, and even when you watched her all through this season, as you know, as the rides became more high profile and the pressure became more, Rachel was still delivering. And you know, she does what all good jockeys do, and that's that she makes very, very few mistakes, and she's extremely consistent. Absolutely. Your your personal take on on her, Kevin, um, when you look back and the milestones that she keeps clocking off, which which seems to be happening so frequently at the moment, such is the level of her riding. Very, very talented. She's very tough, very determined as well. And I think the day of referring to her as a lady jockey is uh, is well gone. Mm. Uh, she's a professional athlete. She's one of the best national hunt jockeys, both in Ireland and in England. And she's proving it time and time again. She was Last year was really a high-profile breakthrough season for Rachel. She was getting on more high-profile horses, riding a lot more grade ones. She had a lot more pressure on her going into races and also going into Cheltenham. She'd never ridden the Cheltenham Festival winner before. She was brilliant on a Plutard, even better on Manila Endo. She yeah. rides with loads of confidence. She's very, very determined. Tactically, she's very aware. And horses jump extremely well for her. And she's so, so tough. There's so many days there during the year. Like all the lads, they get a lot of falls and all. I remember seeing Rachel getting two haymakers of falls at Thurless the year before last. And I think she got three in the one day. She ended up having to be stood down on the third one. She's just so, so tough, determined. She rides with so much confidence. And the better the horses you're riding, the better the rider you're going to be because your confidence gets better and uh, you improve so much. And what Rachel has achieved and what she's achieving is a testament to her and her profession. Absolutely right. Uh, nice words there from Kevin and Ruby on, on Rachel Blackmore, and thank you to her for joining us. We will move on uh, to the back end of the week at the Cheltenham Festival now, rejoining the lads with their thoughts on 2019 and Cheltenham and the success of Album Photo in the big one, in the Gold Cup. Willie Mullins, of course, with plenty in here. Ruby, I know you were on Bells Hill who made mistakes, but... Obviously, your association with all at Close Sutton, with Willie Mullins, the man as well, and uh, the years that you go back with him, 
This was just missing, wasn't it? This was one of the things that was just missing. I think he'd finished second on no fewer than six occasions, but to finally win the Gold Cup, what would that have meant? It meant a huge amount, Nick. I mean, to be the winning most trainer at the Cheltenham Festival and not have the one, won the Gold Cup, it is an omission. And as you said, he'd gone close so many times. He'd four runners in this race. I had the choice and obviously picked the wrong one. I rode Bells Hill. But, you know, Kenboy went at the first invitation, only fell at the third last first time round. And, you know, they went a really strong gallop and Album Photo struggled to, to lie up early. But your eye got drawn to him immediately and it went out in the second circuit. He was the one horse when you look back through the race that was travelling really well. He did take a chance at the second last. He was very good at the last and he really stayed well to win. Alibel Fly ran on to be second. But it was a huge day for Paul Townend. It was a massive day for Willie Mullins to cement... You know, it's the biggest race in the calendar and to have that on your CV, everybody wants it and it was a great day for Joe Marie Donnelly as well. And time Marie has Donnelly told, well. um, subsequently Ruby, just you know yourself, we all know from watching the Gold Cup year in, year out, just how tough it is to come back and a, run in it again, but let alone win it again. Of course, Corto Star won it, lost it and then won it again, but this fella's since become the first horse since best mate to win it in back-to-back -back years. Yeah, look, he obviously, after that, Nick, winning that Gold Cup, he went to Punchestown and was second to Kenboy, then went to Tremor, as he had done before he won in 2019 and won there on New Year's Day. And I think his two performances in Tremor, I mean, he carried the grade one penalty both times in Tremor and gave a lot of weight to horses that weren't rated that far behind him. Mm. On the book and going through form people, they will tell you his performances in Tremor on both years have been outstanding and he's backed that up in the Gold Cup. How good are we talking about, Kevin, in, in your opinion? Obviously, the, the massive day for Willie Mullins, but a huge one for Paul Townend as well, as we were about to find out come, obviously, Ruby's retirement a month and a half or so later, and he's since gone on and, and won the Gold Cup again. But how big an achievement? Oh, phenomenal achievement. And, you know, as Ruby said, Willie has basically won nearly everything there is to him. And uh, he's gone so close in Cheltenham Gold Cups, as Willie said publicly afterwards, he said... I thought I wasn't going to actually win a Gold Cup. He'd been beaten on the line on so many different occasions and horses had uh, hit the crossbar. But it was, uh, it'd be terrible for a trainer, one of the greatest trainers of all time. Uh, we're very, very lucky to be witnessing what Willie Mullins is doing at the time, and at this previous time, at this moment in time, sorry, mm -hmm. and what he's done over the last few years. And uh, for him not to win a Gold Cup would have been terrible. He'll have plenty more time, please God. But uh, it just goes to show the trainer he is, and uh, to get that in the CV, get the to, the goal was absolutely wonderful, thoroughly deserved, and brilliant for Paul Townend as well, because obviously it's a high profile and a high pressure job. Obviously he didn't know at the time he was going to be stable jockey in a couple of months' time, but uh, it just uh, it advertised Paul Townend's talents. What a cool rider he is, again tactically aware, and he's really, really stepped up to the plate this season. Willie Mullins winning the first Gold Cup and it would become two just a year later. We will move on to Aintree and Tiger Rolls. Uh, historic success to become just uh, the first horse since the great Red Rum in the early 1970s to win the Grand National in successive years. Ruby, just seeing you there, you were on Rath Vinden in third. Perhaps if the ground was a bit softer, he might have got even closer, I don't know. I'd love to know your thoughts on that one. But just to summarise the achievement of the winner. I don't think Rat Vinden jumped well enough, actually, Nick. Um, but the winner, and even back up from the canal turn way previous to the shots you're watching, he jumped through on my inside at the fifth or sixth last. And David Russell was trying to slow him down. He was going that easy. And he's jumping really Sue's entry. He's low, he's accurate. He's a heart as big as a lion, um, even though he's called Tiger. And he's just, he really suits the Grand National and the race it is now. It was a pity for connections he didn't get to have a go this year. Hopefully, he'll get to have another go next year. But he is a real Grand National horse and it was a wonderful performance and he did it even better than he had done the year before. But the way he travels, the way he jumps, he must be a pleasure to ride around there. You'd, I'd, I'd ask your opinion on that one because I know the race has changed since and uh, quite publicly we've talked about that. But I don't know, a horse like, say, the 2005 winner Hedge Hunter, once you've got an Aintree Pro, there must be some feeling when you're going out because obviously time and time again he ran well around there, didn't he? Yeah, they do, and I think a lot of the times handicappers add in what they call the entry factor mm. because a horse has done it once there. A lot of horses do it once, very few do it twice. Um, and this fella, he does really like it around there. Now, look, and people have cribbed it and crabbed it and said he wouldn't have run wet, won Red Rum's Grand Nationals. Well, Red Rum wouldn't have won Tiger Road's Grand Nationals either. So, um, you know, that's the race it is now. 
and, and Tiger Roll has gone and won it twice and he really suits it and he's brave, he's he's low at his fences, he's through the top of the spruce all the time and he stays incredibly well. How special for the team was this, Kevin, from, from your perspective, we see Davey with his, his hand in the air and quite rightly so, the second Grand National on this horse, but for, for Gordon Elliott of course and for Jiggins Town House stud. Absolutely brilliant. And especially for Kevin yeah. getting his percentage of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The sterling exchange rate wasn't great at the time, though, Ruby, to be fair. I mean, better this year. But, uh, no, it was brilliant. And You'd have to give out about something. Yeah. <laughs> but great for Davy Russell as well. Great for Gordon, as everyone knows. Myself and Gordon go back a long, long time as well. And great for Jigginstown as well, Michael and Eddie O'Leary. They put a lot into the game. And uh, what Gordon has done with this horse has been, has been unbelievable. Like, uh, you know, he's won a triumph hurdle. He's won... Obviously, a four-mile chase around Cheltenham. He's uh, he looked like he was his career was gone a couple of years ago, and Gordon changed a couple of things with him. And Keith Donahue deserves a great mention about this horse as well because mm. he's been a big part. Uh, and he would have been Keith's uh, ride on a far that Keith couldn't do the weight in him when Davy won them in the first national. And Keith Donahue has done a lot with this horse, uh, freshening up his mind, bringing him out hunting, and that's why Gordon Elliott and the likes of Willie Mullins are so, so good because they think outside the box. They're willing to change and they're willing to treat every horse as an individual and try and get the most out of them. And Tiger Roll has really turned into a people's horse. I think it's very unfair to, as Ruby said as well, people crab that oh, he mightn't have won Red Rum's national. As Ruby said, Red Rum probably wouldn't have won Tiger Roll's national. It's very, very unfair to compare different horses to different generations. And Tiger Roll has really become a people's horse. And... Uh, He's, it, the profile and what he's done for racing in general has brought it to the next level because you, every man, woman and child on the street, they know about the Grand National. They've really uh, cottoned on and joined in in the Tiger Roll story. And uh, he's just a wonderful, wonderful horse. He's got a great name. He's only a pony. He jumps, uh, like I thought the first year, Davey rode him in the National. And I don't mind holding my hands up. I didn't think he jumped well enough to win a National. Uh, I remember Lisa O'Neill running the four miler on him and he uprooted uh, fences on the way around in Cheltenham uh, but he still got away with it and what Gordon done with him last year he won what he won the buying hurdle on his way to Cheltenham that I think was his first time in nearly three years winning over hurdles went to Cheltenham won the cross country for another year and was spot on for the national he's a brilliant horse personally it was a great uh, occasion as well because obviously being involved with Davy and as Ruby said getting the percentage but uh, <laughs> and I must say great for Paddy Kennedy as well Paddy Kennedy the lad who rode the second horse he rides out for me every morning for the last 12 or 14 years before he goes to Jessica Harrington he's one of my closest friends and uh, it was great that he got such a spin out of magic of light to finish back in second for Jessica Harrington I think it was probably I was trying to go for the most diplomatic way of asking you what Davies or your thoughts on Davy winning the Grand National, but they're only going to be good ones. Um, <laughs> now, Ruby, we're, we're going to get to the 1st of May. Um, and to anyone who doesn't know, obviously this was the day that you booted Ken Boy home. Great ride, beat album photo, win the Punchestown Gold Cup. But to anyone who doesn't know or just wants to refresh, when was it that you decided that's that? Oh, I decided long before I went out in Ken Boy's back. Um, but I was just hoping I could win a, a, a big race at the Punchestown Festival and that would make the, the timing a bit easier but look I had said to, I probably had thought if Raf Indian could win the entry Grand National but unfortunately he didn't and then I said to Gillian that I'd do it in Punchestown and um, I wanted to ride in this race I wanted to ride in the Gold Cup and then if he didn't win a grade one thereafter I had so many chances and you always had Benny the Jew coming at the end of the week as a banker anyway so mm. um, it's just the way it worked out and it seemed the right time to do it but um, to be honest with you Nick in the end it was relief I'd had a brilliant career but I was looking forward to a new one and I wanted a change and that just gave me a great out We're about to see the, the shots of you coming back in I'm not sure whether you've got the show on the monitor with you but um, when you see the or when you reflect on the memories that were it, does it stir up a bit of emotion Um, I don't know emotion. It was a day I enjoyed um, that I'll never forget. But it was a day I was ready for. It. It, it, it wasn't something that made me sad. I was delighted with what I'd achieved as a writer, probably proud of what I'd achieved as a writer. I was glad that Gideon and Isabel, Elsa, Gemma and Erica were all there. And yeah. it was yeah, it was a brilliant day and all my friends were there, you know, the rest of my family and everyone was around. So it was a, it was a really great day and 
it was lovely to do it at Punchestown. I was always a Punchestown was a lucky place for me, and when I wanted a big result in the end, Punchestown was lucky again. Just seeing you waving the waving the crowd, waving goodbye, and that was the the fitting send off that you wanted to give, and as you said, the feeling of relief. But obviously, Punchestown poor. continued thereafter. Um, was it just a weird sensation, or was it a, a, a relieved sensation going forward after that, knowing that Punchestown was continuing, but you you had drawn the line in the sand, and that was that. Racing was always going to continue, not just Punchestown. There was going to be Punchestown, Galway, Cheltenham in November, Christmas. Racing was going to go on and someone else was going to be riding the horses. But I had come to terms in my mind well before this that I wasn't going to be part of that anymore. And it was nice to go as a, as a race goer the rest of that week. And it's been enjoyable to go as a pundit all year. Um, I enjoy what I'm doing now. And um, If I was always a racing fan, Nick, I would have gone racing in the winter when I was injured and I love racing and yeah, I'm still enjoying it. Is it a particularly good ride as well that you feel you went out on because it looked it and it was obviously assessed that way but did you feel particularly like it was a, a, a top quality ride to go out on? I don't know, I was riding the best horse and when you're riding the best horse you're supposed to win on it um, and that's what I did but on the day he was the best horse, he was in great form, he bolted in an entry, he brought it back to Punchestown, he travelled well, he jumped well um, you know, you were asking about Rachel earlier. It was only about not making mistakes, Nick. And mm. who makes the fewest mistakes? Usually, raise the most winners. Uh, Kevin, right at the beginning of the show, we mentioned that day. Obviously, the first of May last year when you did interview Ruby thereafter. But what was the atmosphere like at Punchestown? One of sort of celebration, obviously, of a career, but but quite surreal at the same time. Yes, it was. Well, it was obviously a great atmosphere coming back in, but nobody knew what Ruby was going to announce. I think that took everybody by surprise, and I think. Uh, when obviously it came out over the Tanai and it was uh, over the public address system and it was official then that Ruby had retired, the, I think the, the cheers, the atmosphere, it was just electric that day and rightly so. And I think personally for Ruby to go out where he did at Punches Town, his own track, he's been going there since his kid, uh, his family home is in Kill, only five, literally over five minutes up the road from Punches Town. And I think it was probably a very apt place for Ruby to bring uh, the curtain down and what was a, an amazing, amazing career. And uh, right in his local track, as I said at the top of the programme, where every top professional should go out on their own terms at the top of their game. And uh, it was just a wonderful day. And Ruby, just to ask you a question, I know you said you don't miss it, but the likes of Leperstown at Christmas time or going to Cheltenham this year, is there even a moment there that you're inkling, I wouldn't mind doing this again? No, I think when, when um, Faheen won in Leperstown, Chris, uh, Kevin, at the Dublin Racing Festival, and you could see the, the people swarming off the stand to get around the number one, I was thinking, I wouldn't mind being on his back now, walking back into the number one. Now, I didn't want to be on his back at any stage during the race, when he was going through the race and jumping the fences, but I wouldn't mind it being on him to walk back into the crowd, but unfortunately you can't have one without having the other, so I think that was the only time I wanted to be up on a horse, but I still didn't want to ride him in the race. Uh, Laz, and thank Ruby, you. Ruby, sorry, oh. Nick, just one second. And Ruby, just going back to you, I think it's testament to, you know, a lot of jockeys, a lot of professional golfers and whatever else, they they don't really go out in their own terms and they can never really enjoy a life outside of racing or, or the professional sport. But you seem to totally, look, that's part now of one career and you're really enjoying what you're doing now. Yeah, but I, I guess, Kevin, I was lucky going into racing, and I know you since I was a kid as well, that I could never foresee or have dreamt or have wondered or hoped I could have had the career I had. I always knew how much luck would be involved in that, and I always knew that a jockey's career would come to an end. Horses were my life before I was a jockey, uh, or racing was, and racing was always going to be my life after I was a jockey, and I was lucky enough to be a jockey in the middle of it. So for me with the family network I have and the support I have, retiring wasn't going to be that big a deal. There was always going to be something to do and I was going to be able to move on from it and I was lucky that I was. Excellent stuff from Ruby and Kevin. Uh, Ruby reflecting on his career that's been and gone as regards ju uh, jumps racing and riding. But uh, one man whose career is very much on the up but on the flat is Asheen Murphy, who uh, rather lit up 2019, who's kindly on the line. Asheen, first up, obviously I keep saying to everyone, testing times, difficult times, but how are you coping, Asheen? 
Hi Nick, good to hear from you. I'm I'm well. Um, everyone's in the same position. We're all a little bit bored, but um, there's only so much Netflix you can watch <laughs> and only so many miles you can walk. But you know, I just feel for the peop- for the families that are in large towns and cities. Um, you know, it must be much more difficult for them. Absolutely right. Nice words there. Um, and we will look back at 2019, which was a, a superb year for you and everyone associated with you. Just at the end of last year, I seem to remember you saying that, that you had been going for the title the year before in 2018. You just not told anyone about it. But obviously, uh, from early doors in 2019, we could see that that was one big, big target for you. Absolutely. I tried um, my best in 2018. Uh, numerically, I had lots of winners. Um, you know, in the calendar year, but unfortunately not enough to uh, dethrone Sylvester de Souza between um, Guinea's Weekend and Kitco British Champions Day. So, look, to finally do it in 2019 uh, was a huge relief, and um, I got massive pleasure out of it. Obviously, I'd love to be champion jockey again hmm. in the, in the not-too-distant future, um, but there are many people that, you know, will be crying. I, I think nobody should write off Sylvester. He's a workaholic and an absolute gentleman and a world-class rider and lots of young jockeys coming through the likes of Tom Marquand, Jason Watson, uh, David Egan. You know, they're all very hungry, so, um, so it'll be a tough task. Yeah, we've got some lovely years to look forward to, certainly uh, with the flat riders coming through. We'll roll in some shots. I'll, I'll show Deirdre running and winning in uh, Goodwood in the Nassau Stakes. Obviously, you wanted to, to pay tribute to the, the strength of Japanese racing quite rightly after, which we'll come on to. But I just wanted to talk about your team because we see you ride, obviously, day in, day out. And I think in both 2018 and 2019, Asheen, you had more than 1,100 rides on the flat in the UK alone. Just give us an idea of how big the team effort is to make that possible, because just to get you there and, and riding every day takes a lot of work, doesn't it? It does, and, and those rides are condensed to, to possibly a nine-month period, or normally less than nine months, in fact. So I have a super agent, Gavin Horn. Um, he works really hard every day and he knows the phone pretty well. We speak a couple of times a day and, mm. uh, and you know he deals with the success and the failure very well. I have a driver uh, called Sue McAnulty. She brings me the length and breadth of the country. Uh, I have help with my form of Terry Norman. Um, without all these people, it wouldn't be possible. So, you know, I, I, I'm really grateful. She's back, Deirdre, I think back in the UK in, in Newmarket at the moment. But um, how special and significant to you was this day winning the Nassau? It was huge. Uh, she'd been a little bit written off on paper. She ran well, actually, the previous run, considering it was really slow ground. And I know she's by Harbinger, who went to us. Uh, but realistically, she, um, she wants it quite fast. The quicker, the better. And... Yeah, it was just a huge moment. It meant a lot to her um, staff, her grooms and her trainer, her owners. They were all there. So I hope it means more Japanese horses will come to race in Europe in the future. They they have a brilliant breeding program. They've been buying the best mares mm. from Europe uh, and America over the last couple of years. And obviously they bought lots of stallions out to Japan as well. In recent times, the likes of Mind Your Biscuits, who was a dual Breeders' Cup winner and yeah. obviously Harbinger, Maxi. Um, so I think it's onwards and upwards for Japan. With you in the, the sort of the bulk of the season, the, the, the summer where there is any amount of racing going on and there's evening meetings as well, I think we'll show um, in early summer or in early July, Voracious winning the Falmouth Stakes, just to illustrate what we're going to talk about. But um, when, it, when it comes to it, and you are riding however many horses a day, perhaps 10, I don't know, set seven at one and move to an evening meeting to have three, is it an adrenaline rush that keeps you going throughout all of the weeks and months of the summer? Absolutely. It's interesting you bring that up because at the moment I'm getting nine or ten hours of sleep a day. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it, my life isn't very exciting at the moment. So um, I, I don't actually feel that fresh. But when I'm riding nice horses every day and riding winners, uh, I can survive on, on much less sleep and feel an awful lot better about myself. Uh, watching Voracious win there, she was, she was super because um, she was keen at Ascus, so Micah gave me one instruction, that was to get her to relax, but I wasn't able to do that, so the fact that Lee Parker and Sir Michael kept allowed me to keep the ride and to land a Group 1 on her 
uh, for them was a really special moment. Mm. It was a good battle between yourself mid-summer with, with um, of course, Danny Tudhope. But we'll have a look at Ben Battle winning the Joel Stakes at Newmarket's Rowley Mile course. By this time, we, of course, knew that you were going to be the champion jockey come mid-October at Ascot. And, and that day at Ascot, it was a massive... It wasn't just for... For yourself, I suppose it was for the whole team. Given the sponsors of the day, was it was it the experience and the occasion that you, the family, the team would have would have absolutely loved? For sure, it's everything I wanted it to be. Uh, you know, Sheikh Fad and Andrew Bolden were really behind me and being champion jockey, and they are uh, still behind me and I'm trying to be champion jockey again. So that's a super feeling. Uh, just touching on Ben Battle, uh, he's such a special horse and. Mm. Trans, the really competitive field in this group too, and he's means a lot to me. And um, what a servant he's been to so many people. Um, yeah, he actually ran on Kipco Bears Champions Day on very slow ground, and he got bogged down. But uh, I hope you can see more of him in Britain this summer. Yeah, he's a wonderful racehorse and a very, very good one on his peak days. Now, obviously. Come October, the champion jockey, that was one of the dreams fulfilled. But um, another one came out in the Far East just a month or so later. That was when winning the Japan Cup on Suave Richard. I think you described it as, as the dream come true. And, and given your love and affection of Japanese racing, did it mean all the more, Ashim? It meant a, a huge deal. I first watched the Japan Cup in the comfort of my sitting room in uh, 2014, Christophe Sumion won on Epiphania, and I never really felt like I would get the opportunity to ride in Japan, not to mind win a race of this, um, you know, magnitude. So I galloped the horse twice in the lead up to the race, and he did like 51 seconds on the Hill Woodchip at Rito Training Center, which I remember on that morning it was about three seconds quicker than anything else, and it's only over four and a bit furlong, so. I knew I was on a pretty good horse. Then the ground came up really soft, which is uh, not common in Japan, particularly in um, November, December time. It's normally rock hard. So I didn't know how much of a chance he had, but actually the filly that finished second, Coram Bukador, I won a maid on her from my trainer, Mr. Kaneda. And, you know, they just have so many good horses that seem to yeah. line up in the big races all the time. It, it's, um, it's a great place to go and ride. Last well, thing, I'm just interested to know, you've, you've ridden big race winners all around the world. A big race win is a big race win when, when you get to the line in front. But from the atmosphere and the cultural perspective of winning one in Japan, how would it compare to, to a top-level race in Europe? Well, there's much more people there. The crowd is a lot bigger. The build-up to the race goes on for weeks. You know, they have seven racing newspapers published, published daily. When I was on the way home from... Um, Tokyo race course going back to Yokohama we went through Shibuya crossing which is famous in Tokyo it's the most popular so many hundred thousand people pass through it every day yeah. and there was a photo of Suave Richard and I um, coming up on a billboard so you know when you see things like that you realize uh, how big horse racing is in their country and I'll just ask lastly that you were champion jockey in the final year of the decade it was the decade where you announced yourself I think 2013 that that fabulous day when you were obviously a very very young man winning it at air but how do you reflect on that sort of decade culminating in what was that fantastic triumph yeah um, I think champion apprentice was was great and um, you know, I enjoyed all those good horses that I kind of inherited off um, Jamie Spencer and then Andrea Axini, the likes of Lightning Spear and Simple Verse. And although I didn't land any Group Ones on them in, in the years after, um, I managed to finally win one on Lightning Spear last year. But I had a, a really nice time uh, getting yeah. experience in the top races, and then finally to break my Group One duck on on acclaim and. I've ridden 15 Group 1 since, but you know, I've had so many opportunities and that's all down to the trainers and owners I ride for. Uh, I'd like to win a lot more races, but we're on hold at the moment, but there's, there's going to be plenty of time to, to do that as long as I can stay fit and healthy and keep everyone happy. And what, just while we're on the hold, the last thing I'll ask you, um, turning the hand, is there a, a charitable auction that you're, that you're involved with, that you're in charge of, or that you might be able to tell us a bit more about? Yeah, there's lots of good things happening at the moment. Um, Bonhams uh, have got in touch and um, they're aiming to raise money through an, a live auction. Uh, you can check it out on their website. Um, and basically I've uh, offered to do a course walk and also I'm going to give a riding lesson to um, whoever the highest bidder is 
uh, are completely, you know, come to whatever their requirements. Um, if they've never ridden before, we'll start off very basic, or if they ride a little bit, we can do something um, a bit more fun. So uh, please have a look at it, and if it interests you, um, have a bid. Asheen, brilliant stuff. Thank you so much for reflecting on the year that was and obviously uh, bringing us up to date with that as well. Uh, best of luck over the next coming weeks or how long it is until we're racing again, but we'll look forward to it, of course, as soon as possible. Cheers, Nick. Uh, really interesting to hear from Machine Murphy and, and the year that was Ruby Walsh, of course, it brought to the end your career. But what a year on the flat for Machine Murphy, who around the globe, of course, uh, principally in Britain with that championship, but around the globe showed just what a talent he is. Oh, without doubt, Nick. Um, it was a great year for him to be champion jockey at the end of it. Must have been a huge highlight. But look, even to see Deirdre there coming from Japan, you have the Grand Nakayama is on tonight, I think, in Japan, and they have their first classic tomorrow. So racing is still going ahead there. Lucky for them. But <laughs> yeah, look, I suppose globally, Oshin has come in demand, and that's a sign of a, of a tack flat jockey who's gotten to the top. Um, Kevin, you obviously base yourself around the racing world, but you're involved with so many different jockeys, flat jockeys at that. Um, what is it about Asheen Murphy that's that's obviously standing out so much at the moment? He's young, he's got the drive, but the talent is um, is pretty limitless, isn't it? Yeah, and he's only going to get better as well. He's only 24 years of age. He's, as you said there, he said himself, he's written 15 Group 1 winners. Uh, he's tactically very aware. He's very articulate. He speaks very well. He comes across very well. I know him since he was a kid, and uh, he was always very driven and knew what he wanted. Uh, went to Andrew Balding's great setup, great grounding for an apprentice. And for a flat jockey to any jockey, but especially a flat jockey, because obviously there's more flat racing throughout the world, for him to go to the Japans and ride winners on all the big international stages, it just, just shows how talented he is and actually tactically aware to be able to adapt to all the different racing jurisdictions, which is quite difficult. Plenty have tried, a lot have failed. And for what he's achieved at 24 years of age, you would have thought that he's only going to get better going forward. And a lot of flat jockeys don't peak, you would have thought, till later on in their career. You look back at the old videos of, say, Mick Canaan winning a Melbourne Cup and Vintage Crop, and mm. then watch Mick Canaan, who was one of the greatest of all time, winning, the, winning a Galileo fast forward 20 years. The difference in him and his style and, and you know he just kept on improving till the day he retired even look back at Ruby when Ruby started riding winners of the Cheltenham Festival till when Ruby finished uh, he obviously perfected his style he looked a lot stronger always kept on improving and that's what the great riders do they always want to improve they strive to improve and every day is a school day the day you stop learning is the day you may stop very, very true. Um, now, Asheen Murphy, of course, was one of the, the riding stars of last year, but on the flat, one of the equine stars was unquestionably uh, the two-year-old, the unbeaten two-year-old, Pinna Tubo, who was uh, subsequently rated the highest-rated two-year-old in a quarter of a century or so, higher than Frankel. Ruby, you, you said you sort of underestimated him a little bit when he won at Epsom, but what he took his connections to as regards the journey after that was pretty incredible. Oh, it was. I thought when he won in Epsom that the runner-up actually might turn the form with him, which was um, probably a bit ridiculous now when you look back. But he went from there, obviously, to Ascot, and he was brilliant. And his performance in the National Stakes of the Curra was, was breathtaking to stand and watch that live. And he rounded it off in Newmarket. He was an incredible two-year-old. Could he have improved on it? Who knows? Hopefully we get to see him. We get to see him as a two-year-old, but... He will go down as one of the most famous two-year-olds for a long time. Uh, Kevin, you would have been there this day. Obviously, the weather wasn't great, but what an occasion it was, that second day of the Irish Champions weekend, which we'll come to a little bit later. But to go and beat, I think, a couple of really good Aidan O'Brien two-year-olds in a race they traditionally, of course, do very well in. Was this a bit of a, bit of a jaw-dropping moment? I think it was. Uh, I don't think anybody was expecting that performance. And even Charlie Appleby wasn't either, because I spoke to Charlie beforehand. We interviewed him, and he said he's a horse that shows nothing at home. You watch him walking around mm. the parade ring, he's like an old handicapper, he's so relaxed, which I think going forward and for him to train on will stand him in good stead. And as Charlie said, he'd worked with a horse, I think was rated around 72 or 3, his probably his second, his penultimate bit of work before the National Stakes. Mm. Charlie didn't tell me the name of the horse, we interviewed him on Racing TV, and all he could say was that the horse that worked all over him, 
got beat, I think, two days before handing Kempton. So basically, he shows very little at home, but that's what a lot of the great horses do. They're not morning glories. A lot of the morning glories that catch pigeons in the morning, they go to the racetrack and they're no good. We've seen so many of those. We nearly see one of them every couple of years. But this horse is totally opposite. He's six from six. He started off in Wolverhampton back in, I think it was the 10th of May last year. And he just kept on improving with each run. And as Ruby said, for him to win round Epsom as a two-year-old, to go and win at the Cora, it, he just kept on improving with each run. The one run I wasn't that impressed with was the Dewhurst. I thought he was a little bit workmanlike that day, but it was his sixth run of the season. He was on the goal since the early part of May. And he might have just have been, you know, it might have, you know, he had a long season and that might have just been shown. But he still has won. And uh, as I say, he's a very, very good horse. And obviously, he's a lot to live up to. Obviously, his sire, Shamardal, sadly passed away yeah. yesterday. And he's, uh, you know, hopefully, please God, he'll, he'll, he'll uh, fill Shamardal's uh, boots when he does go to uh, stud, whenever that will be. Well, that's the thing. Uh, it's particularly cruel, given the fact that Shamardal last year not only had this horse, six from six, but Earthlight, the middle part, winner five from five. And, of course, one of his most famous sons, Blue Point, did the, the King Stand Jubilee double. Um, which brings me on to the jockey there, because we ought to talk about William Buick, uh, Ruby, because I think it was May at Ascot last year when he, he, he suffered a head injury. He sat out until the beginning of August, which made him miss out on the first four of Pinatubo's wins, but also that brilliant blue point double as well. And obviously for a jockey, a high-level jockey, but any jockey, um, of course, that stage of the season when there were classics, of course, at Epsom and, and Royal Ascot as well, he did have to sit on the sidelines and watch and wait, uh, but he was still quite magnanimous about it when he came back. Yeah, that's the life of jockey. Though. That's going to happen to everyone, where somewhere along the way you're going to get an injury that means you have to sit out and watch. But it's what you do when you come back, Nick. Yeah. He came back and got back on all of those horses, and they won, and he delivered. And that was the most important thing. It doesn't matter how confident you are, how much talent you have. You need a bit of luck when you come back. And those first couple of big horses have to go and win for you, and they did. And, you know, Kevin said he wasn't maybe as impressed with Pinatubo in the Jewhurst, that was the day to me that he showed us that he was a fighter as well as being a as well as being a flash Harry. I'll just stick with you very quickly because I mentioned Blue Point being a son of Shamadal who won the Jubilee on the uh, sorry the King Stand on the Tuesday and then won, won the Jubilee that, that incredible double uh, on the Saturday. But then we never saw him again. Um, the achievement in the space of less than a week, Ruby, was incredible. But perhaps a bit of frustration that we didn't see him thereafter. Yeah, but maybe that should kind of point us in the direction that we should I think we might have temporarily lost Ruby Kevin was talking about the the signal that he's got but Ruby's just frozen out of us slightly just pick up there Kev where we were with Blue Point that that great double at Royal Ascot but of course we didn't see him thereafter yeah, I can see exactly what, uh, why Connections uh, chose to go down the route of retiring the stud go out the top uh, he mm. couldn't really achieve much more, could he? No, that wasn't exactly... I know, obviously, you run the risk then of him going and getting beat, but regards the commercial side of things as well, to attract... Uh, he's retired to study, he was very fast, obviously what he's achieved at Ascot. Um, I, I, I can see exactly why they've done it. And uh, he went out at the top, and uh, obviously then he was the buzz horse. Then when, when uh, breeders are deciding which mares they're going to send the horses to. He's very, very fast. He seemed to have a good temperament as well. Yeah. And uh, I, can, I can totally understand why, uh, why Connections have done that. And going back to what Ruby said about uh, Pinatubo, and I think he hit the nail on the head. That day in the Dewhurst, it looked like Armory had him beat till well inside the furlong pole. And he's a, real gra he's a real terrier. He's a real street fighter. He put his head down and he battled. And I think that's going to stand him in good stead going forward this season. He's a real exciting horse to look forward to this year. He was brilliant last year. And he could even be better this year, please, guys. We'll look forward to seeing him whenever that is. Of course, it won't be the first Classic of the season in two weeks' time. But hopefully, we'll see Pinatubo in due course. Now, we've got to this point, uh, Ruby Walsh, who's rejoined, I think, um, without talking about this point in the flat, without talking about Ballydor. But that won't be for long because, of course, it was, I think it was the fourth time they did the Guineas double at Newmarket. Magna Grecia on the Saturday, Hermosa on on the Sunday, a 10th win in the 2000 Guineas for Aidan O'Brien, just 21 years after the first success, which was King of Kings back in 98. The dominance has just been on another level, hasn't it? 
year in, year out, it's amazing to see the horses they produce and the results they get. Um, this was a huge day for, for Dunnick, obviously, riding Magna Grecia. Um, he was in one of a small cluster of horses that came down the stand side in the Rolly Mile, um, and he stuck at it really well to win. Be, uh, King of Change, who went on to win the QE2, a 10th win in the race for, uh, for Aidan O'Brien, and all 10, I think, have gone straight to the Guineas. They go absolutely uh, prime to the minute. They don't need a prep as regards to the winners of the 2000. Now, Kevin, the 1000 was won by Hermosa, job done, Guineas double. And, but for Wayne Lorden, I think this was the, the second time in three years after winter in 2017 when he'd uh, partnered a seemingly a uh, Ballydor second or third string in the 1000 Guineas, but the result the same, uh, two wins in three years. Yeah, great for Wayne. Wayne is one of the, uh, he flies under the radar jockeys. He lets his riding, uh, he lets his riding do the talking. He's a cracking, cracking guy, one of the most popular guys in the wear and was underrated for quite many years, but he's not flash and uh, keeps himself to himself. He's very light. He's in a very, very privileged position. I think Wayne Lord has only ever been in the sauna once in his life before. He can eat what he wants. He went in just to see what it was like one day. Didn't like it and came back out. And obviously that must be a big, big help to him. He's very light, but he's very, very strong. Tactically, he's very aware. And uh, he's a massive... You look at Wayne Lord and CV, uh, going back to his time in Tommy Stacks, David Watchman, now obviously in Valley Dial as well. He's a massive CV of big race victories. Mm. And he rarely gets things wrong. He's one of the underrated jockeys in Ireland and England at the moment. But uh, you never worry if you see Wayne Lord alongside one in a big race, because you know he'll get, a, he'll get give that 110 percent and going back to Bally Dial as well you're never if it might look you're on a second or third string but there's no such thing as a second or third string with uh, Bally Dial especially in the classics as we've seen the outsider or the prevail second or third string have often come out and win it time and time again and uh, it just goes to show when you're riding in a classic for Aidan O'Brien no matter what price it is you have a massive chance of winning it. We'll talk about that in a moment uh, with the Derby and Anti Van Dyke. But just on that 1,000 guineas, uh, Kevin, I'll stick with you. Is a, there was a sad postscript, of course, a little while later that uh, we wouldn't get to see the second again for Sheila Lavery, that being Lady Kaya, who was a really, really talented filly. That was so, so sad. And it was one of the real sad stories of Irish racing uh, last season. Sheila Lavery, very popular. It's, uh, she, Lady Kaya was pinhooked. She, she was by Danby Man. She was pinhooked by her uh, niece Joanne, and uh, they turned down a lot of money for her. And that takes a lot of doing. They're only a small operation. They train 30 or 40 horses, and uh, they roll the dice with this filly. And it was great to see one of the smaller trainers getting a really good filly, and she trained it perfect perfectly, ridden by Robbie Colgan who uh, still rides a bit over jumps but was predominantly yeah. a jump jockey until he uh, turned his attention to the flat and she's run some race and look for a long time she's gone to win the, the Guineas, she was very impressive in the Guineas trial at Leperstown and she was going to have a big big season, it, would, it was great for racing but it was just so so unfortunate and it was one of the sad postscripts of last season for Sheila Lavery and all her team and even six months after the occasion if you speak to Sheila She's a, quite an emotional woman. And if you speak to her about Lady Kaya, when we interviewed her or whatever, you could see her starting to get emotional mm. and start to well up. And it just meant so much to Sheila. And it was so hard for her and all her team, a small team, to take losing the like of Lady Kaya in unfortunate circumstances. Yeah, very much so. Super talented filly who sadly we lost. And we'll roll on to the derby, of course, at Epsom. And it was Bally Doyle again. A first, third, fourth, fifth and sixth in the race led home by Anthony Van Dyke. who was about to make that break over to the inside at Rail Ruby. I think Japan, of course, would prove the best of this crop. Um, who was in the places on the day. But you were, th you were there talking about Pinatubo, of course, at Epsom. What was your assessment of the derby last year, Ruby? It was a strange enough kind of race. Obviously, Broom, Sir Dragon, a Mad Moon, um, you know, Anthony Van Dyke eventually got up on the inside, Japan staying on the, down the outside. You left there wondering, are there five superstars or are they all one of a kind? It, mm. You didn't, there, was, there wasn't a clear cut winner, and you kind of felt after watching the race if it was ran differently or you ran it again to follow Mink, you get a different result. Now, as you said, Nick, Japan was the one that trained on the best. Sir Dragon Air probably went back the most. Mad Moon, I don't know, I, I thought he stayed. A lot of people thought he didn't. Um, and Anthony Van Dyke might have been unlucky at the Breeders' Cup on his last start, but he didn't threaten much thereafter, did he? 
I just want to go to get your thoughts on the Oaks, Ruby, because uh, we, we, you talked about Frankie de Tori at the very beginning of the show, and I think this was quite a significant moment. We're going to see Annapurna beating Pink Dogwood, so it was almost a clean sweep of the new market and Epsom Classics for Ballydoyle, but Frankie, John Gosden and Annapurna had other ideas. But from a rider, the perspective of this, what Frankie went on to achieve in the next two months, I think this was the 31st of May, on the 31st of July, in exactly two months, he'd won 10 Group 1s from this moment. It was an outstanding uh, mid-summer for him, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it was an incredible year for himself and for, for John Gosden. I mean, and this filly was particularly tough because you think Punk Dogwood was coming to beat her down the mm. outside on the Rhine Moor, the passing the two when she's gotten to the front. But, you know, you're thinking maybe afterwards, God, Ryan, did you, did you go a little bit soon or whatever? But the more the season went on for Pink Dogwood the more disappointed she became and the more clear it became that Annapurna was the better filly and she rallied really well that day for Frankie and it did kick start what was a glorious period for himself and John Gosden it was we'll come on to that in a moment or two Simon. but it was a good fillet for Lingfield Racecourse as well I think both trial winners Annapurna and Auntie Van Dyke uh, they both went on to win at Epsom thereafter as we see Annapurna just getting the better of Pink Dogwood and perhaps fleeting for Ballydoyle a little unlucky in third. We'll continue with John Gosden and talk about one of the superstars uh, Kevin they've had over the last couple of years and this was Stradivarius who was winning the Weatherby's Hamilton Stayers bonus for the second year in a row uh, two million quid pocketed from that alone let alone the prize money from the race. This was of course a couple of races before he would lose that pretty invincible record of recent times but what a stayer he's been over the last few years he's unbelievable and whatever it is about stairs i presume it's the the people the public have really got behind stradivarius i suppose we get to see him with the stairs and look you're racing your your grassroots of racing love to see these stairs mm. and uh, i think that's why the public have really cottoned on to this horse as well obviously he stays he stayed in training longer than a lot you know some of them a lot of them tend to retire at three but he's a real grafter and uh, he, he he's just a proper horse really isn't he mm. and uh, frankie gets a great tune out of him and obviously the end of the season what a result that what a finish it was when q guard has just uh, chinned him on the line at Ascot. but uh, he was very good this season brilliantly trained by john gosden and uh, I think that bonus uh, is wonderful as well because obviously the staying division, because of commercial reasons, has just uh, lost a bit of its own over the last few years because, uh, you know, you want to, if these horses win a derby, you want to drop them back for commercial reasons to a mile and a quarter to uh, make them more commercially viable when they return to the breeding sheds. But uh, great sporting owner as well, and Bjorn Nelson. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, Frankie's throwing away the money there. Happy day, typical of Frankie. But, uh, and it's great that Frankie's involved with a horse like Stradivarius because, as I say, Stradivarius really has grabbed the public's attention and to be ridden by Mr. Public, Frankie de Tory, I think it's great for racing. Ruby, just quickly on Stradivarius after Kevin's thoughts there. You, you said earlier you're a lover of racing, so you'll have seen some great stayers. I mean, recently in the, I don't know, the last 10, 12 years, there'd have been a Yates. It's unfair to compare generations, but how highly do you rate Stradivarius? Oh, he's a very, very good horse. He was probably always vulnerable on soft ground, um, Nick, which he encountered last year in Ascot when Kew Gardens beat him. But he is a wonderful horse. But they do get the affection that other flat horses don't get because of their longevity. And horses, like like anything, need longevity to become popular. And yeah. that's why stayers like Double Trigger, like Yates, you said, that's why they become popular on the flat because they just race for so much longer than than your classic Colts or even your classic fillies. And like even a filly like Enable, because she keeps coming back, has garnered a huge following. Would she have gotten the same following if she was retired as a three-year-old after her first arc? I wouldn't think so. Absolutely right there. She is an amazing filly, and it brings us on to her. She's got the longevity. She's got the ability. She's got the lot. And this was her return in 2019. She'd returned a lot later in 2018, but this was the Coral Eclipse when she beat Magical, I think four times Enable beat Magical, and we know what a good filly Magical was. But this was the first step on the rung for her in 2019, Kevin, before, of course, it ended with that, that agonising defeat in, in the arc. But she has given racing so many great days, and it does sound as though there's more to come. Yes, definitely. And just going back to what we are saying about the stairs and longevity of them, and, and I think Judmont have to be commended for keeping this filly in training because, the, you know, your public latch on to these horses, and... Uh, 
you know, as, as Ruby said, I, I couldn't agree more with him. If she was retired as a three-year-old, she wouldn't be half as popular as she is now. But, uh, you know, people just love her. She's a brilliant, brilliant mare. Uh, there were some great finishes, great races between her and Magical last season. I think the closest Magical got to her was maybe a half a length of that. And it was just a shame she didn't win the uh, arc for the third year in succession. For me, a long way out, she looked like she was home and hosed to the last 100 yards, really, when Wildgeist uh, has got up and chinned her. But hmm. I just, it sounds stupid, but I just think that just stretches her, the arc trip. She's won it twice, but I just think it's a class has been getting her through with the last couple of years. And I just thought this year she was just running on empty those last 100 yards, and that trip just probably stretched her. She's so, so good, and she's so much class. That's why she's been getting it. But it, just this year, to me, it was uh, it was uh, very obvious to see that she just started to run and empty the last 100 yards. Interesting thoughts. That was particularly taxing ground for her. We'll look forward to seeing yeah. her again. One we won't be seeing, of course, is too darn hot, who, Ruby, I mean, he was the star two-year-old, unquestionably. He didn't get to the Guineas at Newmarket. Uh, then he ran in the Dante, the Irish Guineas, the St. James's Palace, defeats in all three. The, the aura of invincibility had gone. But he went to the Prix Jean Pratt, won that, and then this turned out to be his last performance in the Sussex Stakes. And it does leave you wondering, perhaps fantasising a little bit, as to what we might have seen at the back end of his three-year-old career, but I guess we'll never know. No, we won't ever know, but I think it proved, if we needed proof, I don't think we did, um, of the class of John Goss and how he mm -hmm. did change tack with him and you know, brought him to France and then brought him back here and he looked a different horse. Um, you know, maybe he had a, a fraction harder race in the Dante for his first start than they thought. I actually think that the race in Abel had against Crystal Ocean in the King George left its mark come the arc more so than not getting the trip and I wonder the two darn hot just have too hard a race the first day in the Dante that took the edge off him the next twice but mm. he was brilliant in the Sussex Stakes um, and the future could have been anything but look race horses are no different than anybody else they need a bit of luck and unfortunately for two darn hot he didn't have it. Now we'll look forward to his career at Stud another win for Frankie de Tour in that magnificent summer of 2019. Now, uh, Batash was one of the sprinting sensations, as he has been over the last few years, and I'm delighted to say his regular jockey is on the line, Jim Crowley. Jim, all things considered, how are you? Good afternoon, Nick. Yeah, very well, thank you. Good man. Now, in terms of Batash, well, I, oh, you've said he's a pleasure to ride. We can see that on his good days. He is electric. But what does the name Batash sort of stir up inside you when you hear that name? Well, obviously, look, he's a real favourite of mine now. Um, and everybody's used to seeing him come back sort of the last three years and, and put in some amazing performances. So, um, yeah, he's, he's obviously one of my favourites and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back on him. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, look, we'll take out a couple of the highlights from 2019 and go to the, the Temple Stakes at Haydock. It was his second win in the race. He was dominant. We, we, we've talked about the stalls and positions where, where, where he's been positioned in the stalls in the past. But um, you said you purposely missed a beat this day. Was that quite significant? Yeah, I, I did actually. I knew. I mean, obviously, I knew there was going to be a bit of pace in the race with, with Catchy, and and I I just didn't want him blazing off in front. Um, he's one of those horses. He he does his own sort of thing anyway. He's, he's not the easiest horse to actually step in the race because he's got so much natural speed. Um, but that day, he just got a toe for long enough, and at halfway, he sort of puts the race to bed, really. We'll have a look at Goodwood, which has been one of his happy hunting grounds, of course, and perhaps the style of the win was slightly different this time. But the race in between, I just want to know, with Blue Point, the second year you've been second to Blue Point, what, what's been your assessment of the two runs in the King's Stand? Um, I think Asker, look, he, he hasn't run a bad race there at Asker. Um, it just probably finds him out. It's, it's a stiff stiff five furlongs um, uh, he loves Goodwood you know he runs downhill for mm. the first three furlongs there and he's sort of freewheeling and it's hard to find a horse quick enough to sort of turn him along um, obviously this year or should I say last year I was didn't really want to give him a hard race um, you know because it, he's a horse who, who gives so much and he puts in these big performances and sometimes he doesn't back them up because he, he, he leaves it on the track. Was that the thing, the whole experience at Goodwood, obviously he won the race and his third successive winning the race, but as we see him cruising up there to go and win, um, was it all consciously geared around three weeks later and really getting into that numb thought? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously he, he'd been to York twice and uh, off the back of big performances at Goodwood and it just hadn't worked out for him. And look, it, it probably wasn't the strongest race at Goodwood. 
Um, and I felt that I just, just didn't want to give him a hard race. And mm. Funny enough, he was just eyeing a little bit in front of me that day. Um, but he, he could do no more than win, and you know it worked out well. Let's have a look at the num thought, because it hadn't worked out for him in the two years prior to this, but this was the demonstration if ever anyone needed anything. The York hoodoo was gone if there was ever one. Um, for that reason alone, for justification for the horse, how satisfying was this day? Oh, it was massive. I mean, obviously, it, it had a lot of people doubting him, and uh, he'd been, to, as I said earlier, he'd been to York twice and, and disappointed, and he absolutely blew his brains there, uh, you know, the, the t two years before that, um, down at the start, he completely lost the plot, but mm. uh, as he's got older, he's, he's matured more and, and become more amenable and much more relaxed, and uh, we were drawn in the right place, we got a lovely toe off or nay and we were around the speed and just everything was perfect that day. Was that the best day? Was that the best he's ever been? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, uh, I thought he was sensational. I thought when he won the Prix de l'Abbé, uh, sort of by four and a half lengths, he was very, very good then. But uh, I think it'd be really hard to top top what he did at York in the number four. I just found a quote from Charlie Hills. He said, he's so fast, it's ridiculous. He said, it's hard to ask a sprinter to sprint. It's the worst thing you can do. It's all about balance and getting the horse on a nice, even keel. With a horse like this, we know that he obviously, he's, he can be, or he certainly was earlier in his career, a bit hot-headed, but he's got the talent to, to match up with that. Has it just been a learning curve with each and every year that he's been a racehorse? Yeah, I think the horse is mentally matured. Obviously, look, they had to geld him after his two-year-old career. Yeah. He was a real handful, um, and as every year has, has gone on, he's mentally got better, uh, and we've we've got a sort of routine with him now, and it works. Um, I think the one year at Ascot, he, he popped out in front, and, he, and I'd love to have got a lead with him that day, and he was sort of there to be shot at. Um, he, I'd love to win a King Stand with this horse, yes. but obviously whether we'll do that this year, it, it's all a bit up in the air, but. He's a real star, and I think, like I said, as, things, as, as the years have gone on, he's, he's matured mentally and he's, he's got better. Well, we'll look forward to seeing him as and when we do, because on his brilliant days, well, he's absolutely irresistible. Um, I just want to pick out one other moment, um, and that would be last May at Newbury in the lock-in stakes. The, the success of Mustachery, a, a Sir Michael Stout improver, of course. Um, was he booked for Dubai quite recently? Of course, we didn't get World Cup night, but would he have been on the, on the list for that? He was, he was. He actually went there, um, and I went and rode him in a piece of work just just before he left. And he, it was he was a sensational piece of work. He was brilliant. Um, I was really looking forward to riding him. Um, he's a real star, this horse. I mean, he's, he's tough, consistent, and it was nice to win a, a Group One with him. Um, and hopefully, he can be as good this year. Um, you know, but he was he was brilliant in the lock in. He just got a lovely mm. toe into the race that day and. He stayed a mile very, very well. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a super training performance as well. well we're just watching the closing yeah. stages of the, the lock inch, and you were tracking. Uh, you came off the or came under the pump. Mustache we did under under your drive, just in behind Lawrence. But did you did you know you were going to find as much as you did at the end? Yeah. Well, I thought I'd, I'd had the had the best of uh, Lawrence. I followed her the whole way, and mm. I thought I, I could take her whenever I want. And he actually won it very well. Um, uh, he was. I thought he was a bit unlucky when he went to Royal Ascot, um, and he just got no no room really. But yeah. uh, you know, he he was very consistent all season really. Well, Jim, thank you for coming on. Just just to sort of paint the picture, illustrate for us what what you've been doing with the this prolonged period, how you occupy in the time and DIY and things like that. Or is, what what do you do with your time at times like this? I'm running out of jobs to do. To be honest, <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to getting back. Um, Trying to keep fit. I had a couple of couple of weeks off where I didn't do any exercise. I, I'm sort of normally a bit of a fitness fanatic, and um, I've just started to back again now, running and trying to keep keep in trim and keep uh, keep myself focused. And it's been a it's been a, a nice couple of weeks to spend with the family, but um, certainly chomping at the bit now. Yeah, very much so. I think we all are. Jim, keep safe and well, and hopefully we'll see you racing again very soon. Thanks very much. Take care. Cheers. Uh, just very quickly, get the thoughts of Ruby on. I mean, Ruby is, a, as you keep saying, a, the, the fan of the sport. Um, Wemba Tash, who obviously Jim Crowley rides with, this, uh, rides, uh, with plenty of distinction, when he's on his going days, he's absolutely dynamite, isn't he? He is, but he's a bit, little bit like Marmite, isn't he? <laughs> um, you either love him or you think, oh, what's he going to do? And 
I, look, he has put in some brilliant performances. Obviously, that Nuntop um, in York, Haydock, as, as Jim said, the day he won the Abbey, he was exceptional as well. But you just love for a flat horse to go and do it at Ascot and to win a King's Stand, I think, would raise him into a different echelon even. Mm. But um, look, he's an unbelievably fast horse when he gets it all together. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other riding achievements during the year um, and stick with Royal Ascot. And of course, there was an incredible, incredible story building on the first day of Royal Ascot last year. Uh, Kevin, and that was Frankie's magnificent four-timer, and it was just ended uh, in the Britannia, I think, when Turgenev was second. But that was Frankie at his favourite meeting, the public all watching, and it was some story, wasn't it? Oh, unbelievable story. And obviously it goes back to the Magnificent Seven all those years ago at Ascot, and that's obviously why Frankie, and rightly so, had such a, an affiliation with uh, with the place. But Frankie de Tory is one of the greatest riders we've ever seen in the flat, and he just has attracted so much public interest in racing because not very many high class jockeys will walk down the street and your Joe public who've no interest in racing will watch will know who they are but he's the most recognisable face in racing of all trainers, jockeys, owners you name it, it's Frankie de Tory and uh, he just he just when he comes to the big days the Royal Ascot, the group ones or whatever he just he just loves it and his enthusiasm is infectious, and uh, he's just getting better and better. He's like a, a fine wine, a vintage wine. He gets better with age. But that was a brilliant day in Ascot, and it really got the public imagination going as well. Well, I'll tell you what was a brilliant day. Not the weather, uh, but the emotion, the cause, everything, and the, the atmosphere on the day just to watch on was, uh, of course, Irish Champions Weekend, the Sunday, when there was the Pat Smullen uh, charity race, which Ruby, you were a participant in and you found your old foe, but your great friend, uh, Sir Anthony McCoy, just won too good on the day. I think you said, I don't know, a few months later, you said from some way out, you knew McCoy had this. <laughs> yeah, look, it was a great occasion. It was great to take part in it. And I think a lot of the lads had to make more effort than I did to ride in it. I was only recently retired, whereas the rest of them were off for, for quite a while. So um, the effort they put in was wonderful, but it was for a great cause and mm. no one needed to be asked twice. It was great to be part of it. Um, as for the race, it was pretty straightforward. From the time we crossed the junction, I wasn't going to get to AP. Um, I thought Johnny Murta was for a while, but I think AP's strength, he was just that bit strong for Johnny, wasn't he? Didn't he swap horses, Ruby, in the, in the build-up to the race? AP? Yeah. I think, he'd, I think he'd found another horse maybe a few days before oh, yeah, he found he, the right one. Yeah, he, he wasn't happy with what he got first time anyway. He was giving out and complaining. So um, we had to swap, swap him around until he was content. Fair enough. Um, Kevin, obviously, uh, so uh, personally linked and a great, um, great person in your life is Pat Smullen. And for him, this occasion must have been well, pretty jaw-dropping for him to to see the weight of, of, of public affection to go towards it, but also the amount of money that has been raised by this day. Yeah, I think overwhelming, overwhelmed is the word to use, I think, uh, regards uh, Pat when it came to this. And Joe Foley of Ballyhane Studs uh, deserves great praise for this because actually he came up with the idea. He ran it past the committee on the Longines Irish Champions Weekend Committee, rang Pat, and Pat was all for it. And obviously Pat was planning to ride in it for for uh, obvious reasons he couldn't ride in the end. But uh, to get all those lads back, the Rubies, AP, Johnny Murta. Johnny Murta was really in the zone that day, wasn't he, Ruby? He thought he was going out to ride the derby again. Oh. He even gave Joseph a nudge there a furlong and a half down. Get back in there, son. You're not getting a run here. And uh, it was just brilliant. Everybody really got involved. And uh, I think Johnny Murta thought he was going out and sitting there one of those hats again, didn't he, Ruby? Ah, oh, he did. He was really up for it. But they were all great. Richard Hughes, Ted Durkin, Kieran Fallon, Paul Carberry, Charlie Swan. They all made a huge effort, you know, between shedding weight and getting fit um, to go and ride in the race. But it was a good occasion. As Kevin said, there was a huge crowd there. Uh, it was a pity it rained um, because I think even more people would have come. But it was a great day out and it was great to take part in it. It'll always be a pity it's for the cause it's for, but it was great to take part in it. But Kevin, just on the what Ruby's been going on about quite rightly there, about the about the actual occasion, that the race, what you said as well, the cause, just the facts and figures. Didn't it raise about, or certainly by Christmas, two and a half million euro for, for cancertrials.ie, which is a staggering figure? Yes, uh, it's phenomenal. And a couple of the, there was a, obviously a, a 
a dinner in the Shelburne the night before, after Leperstown. And there was an auction that night as well, a live auction that uh, earned a lot of money as well. And Sheikh Hamdan, uh, Stephen Collins, Sheikh Hamdan's uh, manager here in Ireland, uh, stood up and uh, made an announcement that Sheikh Hamdan uh, had made a significant donation. It was unbelievable. And uh, I remember some of the cancer trials, uh, team from the cancer trials, a couple of the people from the cancer trials, Ireland were there that night. And they said to us that you don't realise how much this is a game changer for research into pancreatic cancer and that the amount of money that's raised and everybody in racing should be so, so proud of what they have achieved. They just couldn't believe this. And they said that it's just a complete game changer for them. And it just goes to show what a community and what an industry we're in when something needs to be done, when somebody's in need, that everybody doesn't even have to be asked uh, twice from people who threw two euros and three euros into a bucket uh, at the collections at the races to uh, spending all the money on the auction prices and the uh, anonymous donations and all, everybody from small to your biggest uh, part of the industry and people who are involved in racing, they all put in, dug deep into their pockets. And it just goes to show what an industry it is when something needs to be done, everybody gets stuck in. And it was a wonderful day, a wonderful uh, occasion. And it was the day for me that the Curra was officially launched. As I said in the top of the programme, you had people there who were just jumping through and through, National Hunt people. Mm. They've never been to the Curra before. They went to the Curra. And it just shows the, how high people hold Pat Mullen as well. A lot of people don't even know Pat Mullen. They went there that day to support the, the, the day and to support Pat Mullen. And as I say, for Search for a Song to go and win, the ledger that day owned by my Glare stud farm that Pat Mullen has such a long standing association with basically since the day he started in Dermot Wells and obviously he's very close personally to Ava Marie Hafner as well and uh, I think that was just the icing on the cake that Ava Marie won the ledger with search for a song on Pat Mullen's day just watching the concluding stages one last time but, but through everything obviously the, the charity race stands out but all told, the quality on the day, it's a meeting which is growing and growing and growing, Kevin. Um, we're seeing the, the concluding stages, as I said, of the Irish St. Ledger, but presumably a day you're going to reflect on fondly for quite some time. Yeah, I think everybody will. And uh, the Longines Irish Champions Weekend has grown in strength every year from, you know, it's only in its early stages, really, whatever it is, it's four or five years, and it's got bigger and better every year. The challenge from England, which is very important, has got bigger. And obviously Deirdre coming from Japan to finish fourth in the matron stakes behind Magical. And uh, to be one of these great festivals, say, you need an international challenge. And I think all the team in the Ch Champions Weekend that uh, came up with this idea initially uh, deserve a lot of credit and it's getting bigger and better every year and it's something that we should be very proud of in Irish racing. Absolutely right. Final couple of minutes to the show. So, Ruby, um, 2019, of course, the year that, uh, that your life, your career would have changed and the fact that two decades worth of riding or so uh, ended back in May, but, but the start of something else for you, so quite a significant year. But when you look back at, at the whole year, both the flat, the jumps, the, the human achievement, the equine achievement, what's been the standout for you as we look back? So personally, I'll never forget Punchestown, but when you look back, I suppose Equine, Tiger Roll winning the second Grand National album, photo winning the Gold Cup. I think Frankie the Tory and John Gosling throughout the summer um, were, were incredible. That great King George and Abel beating Crystal Ocean. You had Frankie on, I think it was Starcatcher and the Curra that we didn't mention in the yeah. Irish Oaks, which was a brilliant ride to watch. There was, you know, on Pinatubo as a two year old, it was just, it was incredible racing, high-class racing, and as Kevin has said, that Irish Champions weekend. But I think the standard for me there, looking at it, was Pinatuba winning the national stakes, but it did show, I mean, he went back to the Dewhurst, how much that Irish racing needs English racing, and that English racing needs Irish racing. Mm -hmm. um, they both need each other's horses to have great races, and we got them that weekend. Absolutely right, Ruben. Just lastly, just a couple of your weighing room colleagues, Noel Feely, Wayne Hutchinson, two, uh, two very dependable, very good riders hanging up the, hanging up the boots in 2019 as well. 
Yeah, and both had, had great careers. Noel obviously um, announced his retirement after Eglantine Desai had won in Cheltenham when she won the Mayor's Novice Hurdle and he retired a couple of days later or weeks later in Newbury when he rode a winner for Harry Fry. And, you know, Wayne Hutchison took over from Chalk Thornton and Alan King's yard and yeah. he went out in the winner and talk is cheap. And, you know, they were two very good, reli- two very good reliable and consistent riders. Ruby, Kevin, thank you very much for your contributions throughout uh, the racing years 2019, which has brought to a close the series which began in 2011 and ran through until last year. Thank you for watching. We'll see you soon.